Friends, as Christians, we have a right, we have a duty, we have a moral obligation to vote, to be engaged in the public life of this country. Well, friends, today was election day here in the United States, and uh, I did my civic duty, I got my sticker. I had a funny experience waiting in line, though. I was standing there, and uh, I was wearing my Roman collar. One, because that's what I'm wearing uh, for my license picture. But two, it's like, these are the clothes I wear. So there I was standing in line and someone turns around and goes, huh, are you a priest? I said, yes. And she goes, I didn't know that priests were allowed to vote. <laughs> it was a hilarious comment. And uh, I said, well, of course we're allowed to vote. Um, I live here. I'm a citizen of this country. I live right here in Wadsworth. And my address is right up the street. And I'm very concerned about a lot of things happening in the country. So yeah, of course we can vote. I've been thinking throughout the day now about her comment, and I think it's very indicative of people's deep misunderstanding of the relationship, I think, between church and state, right? I think that's what she was getting at. Like, it's interesting that, oh, priests can vote. You, as a member of the clergy, a member of the church, are voting, participating in civic life. There's a deep misunderstanding, I think, in many people's minds about this whole notion of separation of church and state. That phrase, separation of church and state, it doesn't even appear in the Declaration of Independence. It doesn't appear in the Constitution. It appears originally in a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptists. He's reflecting and commenting on for them, uh, he's commenting on the First Amendment. And the phrase he uses is a wall of separation between church and state, right? What many people assume about this phrase is that this notion of separation of church and state is that the, that the state is to be protected from the interference of religion. That's what most people assume. Like the lady in line with me, what do you mean? You appear a member of the church voting, participating in the life of the state? Yeah. When in fact, Jefferson's comments are speaking to the direct opposite of that notion. The idea that the church religious citizens would be protected from the interference of the state, right? This is the First Amendment of the United States, the First Amendment of the Constitution, which I'm going to read for you from my collected works of the United States and the Constitution of the United States. First Amendment reads as follows. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. First Amendment. Also, there's some other uh, rights included in there, but that that's the first. That's the first, and it's first for a reason. It's first for a reason. Just like in the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. That is first for a reason. That's first for a reason. Because the framers of the Constitution, they realize that in order for this American experiment to work, the people, the people of this nation had to have a moral and religious framework. They had to have a, have a moral and religious framework. John Adams, John Adams, he's writing to the Massachusetts militia, his letter dated October 11th, 1798. He wrote this, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. He uses the image of a whale breaking through a net to describe what would happen to this country, to this constitution, if the public, if the, if the citizenry was no longer moral and certainly no longer religious, just as a whale would smash through the constitution, smash through a net, so too would a irreligious and immoral people smash through the constitution. It's for this reason, it's for this reason that all Christians, all the more, have a duty and an obligation to be engaged in civic and public life, to engage the public sphere, right? Jesus commands us, in fact, go into the whole world is the commandment. It's not retreat from the whole world, set up for yourselves little Catholic Christian ghettos. No, it's an engagement with the whole world, right? Because it's for the sake of the world that he came, right? God so loved the world that he sent his son. The God, the God that we love, the God that we serve loves this world and he wants to see its transformation. So all the more, we as Christians, we as committed disciples are called to engage in public and civic life. And in fact, this is what the catechism teaches, right? Catechism paragraph 1915, listen to this. As far as possible, 
Citizens should take an active part in public life. The manner of this participation may vary from one country or culture to another. One must pay tribute to those nations whose systems permit the largest possible number of the citizens to take part in public life in a climate of genuine freedom. We are called, we are called to bring to bear into the public sphere those convictions that we have that, yes, that come from our faith, but that are common to all men, right? This is the natural law tradition that we have as Christians, right? That God has written into the human heart certain truths that reveal the full flourishing and the promotion of the common good, right? This is why we are called to engage in these matters. This is why we're, we have to vote, right? And there are many issues to weigh and to consider while voting these days, but there is none weightier than the right to life. Absolutely none weightier, right? The Dobbs versus Jackson decision that the Supreme Court ruled on earlier this summer, overruling the 1973 decision of Roe versus Wade, this was a historic landmark in our nation's history. Right? The Supreme Court justices looking at that decision said, it's not good law, this is not good science, this is not good reasoning, this shouldn't have happened. And so they overturned it, rightfully so, returning the issue to the states. So it's for citizens of the states to vote on different issues, different candidates who have a particular view of the human person and the dignity of the human person. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Even though Roe versus Wade has been overturned, there's still a lot of work to be done to further the pro-life cause, which is not just simply a pro-birth cause. The pro-life cause is pro-woman, right? Because many of those babies who get aborted, they are female, right? If women have rights, which we believe they do, when does a woman begin, if not a conception? When does a woman begin to have rights, if not at conception, right? The pro-life issue is a pro-woman issue. It's also a pro-man issue. It's a pro-family issue. It's a pro-marriage issue. It's a pro-health issue. It's also a pro-science issue. Every other right that we have, every other right that we may exercise as free citizens of this great nation, all those rights presuppose the right to life. You cannot exercise any other right if you are not already alive. If any member of the human family is threatened, if any member of the human family is considered less than human, then all members of the human family are threatened. Friends, and if you're still on the fence on this issue, I want to encourage you to go onto YouTube and to try to watch a four-minute film called The Procedure. Just type in The Procedure in the search bar it's the first search result that comes up. But I want to warn you, it's tough to watch. It's graphic. It's intense. It's barbaric, actually. But that's exactly what abortion is. That's exactly what abortion is. Friends, as Christians, we have a right. We have a duty. We have a moral obligation to vote, to be engaged in the public life of this country. We do. We have a right to be engaged in promoting the common good, right? That's what love is. Love demands that we will the good of the other. Right? I want you to experience the good. I want you to flourish. It's an amazing thing to live in this great nation. It's an amazing thing to have the right, to have the opportunity to even vote and to engage in these things. So thank you, God, for giving us this great nation and the opportunity to engage in civic life.